Welcome aboard, everybody. My name is Dubious, always professional here, trying to unmute mics at the right time and stuff like that. But, um, you know, that's that's independent podcasting. That's independent creating. So uh, it is what it is. And um, this that you are tuned into is a spinoff of uh, my mix show, which is called After the Smoke is Clear. On After the Smoke is Clear, I play uh, independent hip hop from, you know, my favorite artists across the country. And um, each week I play new music, new release stuff, try to highlight that. Uh, newly on board is my friend DJ Baggy Lean doing mixes uh, and scratching across the uh, entire episodes. So make sure you check out After the Smoke is Clear. If you haven't, uh, mixcloud.com slash dubious is where you can find that. Uh, so in this spinoff segment, the O-Fly in Formation, I've been trying to talk to artists from across the country. Um, and I think I've done something like 30 different interviews doing my best to talk to the who's who of rap from coast to coast. And um, a lot of it has been facilitated by my guest today, uh, Thomas Quinlan from uh, Hand Solo Records, uh, Toronto-based independent uh, label that has been putting out all sorts of music, um, not just in the past few years, but for quite a few years before that. So, um, you know, welcome to the show, Thomas. I'm glad to have you aboard and it's, it's nice to be able to actually talk to you. We've sent emails and stuff back and forth, but nice to be able to sit down and chat. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice to uh, be on the show. I've been watching for a while. Right on, man. I appreciate it. And, um, you know, like uh, a lot of the interviews have been, you know, uh, because you've got people putting putting new music out on hand solo. So, uh, you know, I play a ton of that stuff on at sick all the time. Um, you know, of course, props on on the music. You know, we got uh, Mickey O'Brien popping up in chat uh it shouts to shouts to mickey o'brien talked to him last year but um you know can we can we just start off with um can you tell me what hand solo records is right now in 2023 um i guess in its most basic sense it's uh it is a record label um but um i i would say kind of a, I do a little more jack of all trades for you know whatever whatever the artist kind of needs so in, in some cases I've like helped organize some touring helped uh, do some management type stuff um, just you know whatever I whatever is necessary in order to to help these artists succeed that uh, I get involved with nice so a little bit of like management and promotion kind of end of things too then yeah. Yeah, sometimes, uh, you know, it's it basically like um, I find that different people I work with have different strengths. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll play up their strengths and the areas that they may not have as much of a focus on is kind of where uh, I try to do my thing. Uh, some of it probably better than in others. It's uh, pretty much always a learning experience. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I'm uh, I find that. Uh, with each release, I, I learn a little something new that uh, helps with the next release after that. Totally, man. So much of the indie music grind is just that learning curve and just like, you know, building the plane as it's flying through the air. A lot of the time, I get the feeling. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, totally. Um. So, but this isn't something new though. Like Han Solo has been around. I mean, as far as I've paid any attention to Canadian independent releases, I remember seeing releases from Han Solo Records. Like, can you tell me the story of like how Han Solo came around? When did you start it up? Uh, first release was in 1996. Wow. Um, so it started, uh, it started, I guess, kind of percolating in 95. I, um, I guess as the, the story goes, I had, um, I hadn't done my taxes in a few years. This was back when I was in university. My dad uh, was the guy doing them for me, and uh, he did three years worth of taxes for me at, at one time, which got me a little bit of money back. And so I was trying to figure out what to do with that money. And at that time, I was kind of heavily into the Halifax hip hop scene, was, um, you know, just kind of, I don't know, just really into hip hop at that point in time and, and wanted to, uh, I guess, kind of do my part for it, uh, get involved in it. And so, uh, I put that money into putting out a couple of releases, uh, starting with Basements of Bad Men in 1996. 
the um, uh, the thing that kind of really solidified the idea that I wanted to do this was that around that same time when I was trying to like think, okay, well, what should I do with this money? One of my options is to do a record label, but where do I start? How do I do this? And uh, at the time, I was also writing for a few uh, a few different magazines. And I had applied to write for another magazine called Watch Magazine. They got in touch with me, and um, the first article they wanted me to write was how to start uh, an indie record label. <laughs> so I basically was like, all right, well, you know, I've got the opportunity now to approach all these other labels on an official stance to kind of say, how did you do it? And right. that you know, knowledge to use for myself as well and make some money with an article. <laughs> wow, man. Um, your blueprint is is shockingly uh, similar to what's going on over here, man. I'm just I'm tapping in, learning industry secrets week by week, talking to people or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> That's dope. And lately, like I've been joking, you know, like the classic kind of worksite discussion about like what would you do if you won that lottery? We're looking at the 70 million lotto a couple uh, about a month ago. We were talking about like. Man, with seventy million dollars, I would make such a record label. I would put on artists across this country with that type of money, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's kind of funny to hear that like it was a a tax uh, return or whatever and a lump sum oh, yeah, of money, yeah. like not quite the lottery, but um, no, you know, it was, uh, two thousand and two thousand five hundred dollars at the time, which was a pretty good amount of money. Like I, I think that got me. Probably through uh, Basements of Bad Men and then uh, the next two vinyl releases, which would have been uh, the 6-2 Mocha only split 12-inch Crystal oh. Senate and the Buck 65 uh, Wildlife 12-inch. So I'm pretty sure that that more or less probably financed those three releases. Dope, man. Um, you do a lot more money back then, or do a lot more with money back then. Hell yeah, went a little bit further, but uh, but still, man, um, yeah. uh, props on, you know, getting the, the ball rolling and turning it into something that's still here all these years later. Um, that's pretty amazing in, in independent music at all, uh, you know, any genre, but especially, like, there's so many hip-hop artists that seem to kind of come and then disappear, you know, they're here and they're gone so quick that... Uh, longevity is is scarce especially i think in the independent game where people aren't selling millions of albums and stuff like uh yeah yeah man so can you can you talk about like like how many projects do you think you've actually released over these years it's been music coast to coast you mentioned you were in halifax to start it up and that mocha only was one of the first projects you put out so right from the start Canada wide, right? Um, uh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, um, I was never actually in Halifax. Um, it started out here in Toronto. I just really uh, loved what was coming from Halifax, uh, especially so, when comparing it to what I was getting here in Toronto. I just found it to be a lot more creative. It was kind of like they were out there doing uh, doing some different stuff, and I, I kind of wanted to, I guess, put my hand in there to, like, be somebody from outside of Halifax um, promoting the stuff. Like, I, you know, I, a lot of the stuff that was coming out of Halifax was uh, local and difficult to get my hands on. Uh, I got some during a trip or two where I went out there, but uh, primarily, you know, my my ability to hear Halifax hip hop outside of Halifax was Hip Club Groove. And, um, and sorry, is that a radio show? School me. What's Hip Club Groove? Uh, hip, hip Club Groove is uh, it was um, a hip hop trio, I guess, when when they kind of like made their big debut, uh, which was DJ Moves and Check Love and uh, um, Mackenzie, who's now I guess went by D Rock, uh, uh, I guess later on in his career. So, so you probably, you know. I think a lot of people probably know a few of those people like uh, DJ Moves and Mackenzie went on to uh, be with Len for a little while uh, during, I guess, the Steal My Sunshine period. And uh, Chuck Love, you probably know as uh, Corey in uh, Trailer Park Boys. Dope, man. This is gems right here. This is Canadian yeah. hip-hop gems that you just casually so, dropped yeah, they, there. They I didn't, the, the I've, thing. I've worked with DJ Moves and I didn't know that mm. about his history so <laughs> I, knew, I knew he was part of len but prior to that i wasn't aware so yeah uh, yeah that was his uh i think his first group there's a few other people like six two used to be part of it dj gortsky used to be part of it like back before uh their big murder records album came out which is why i was able to get that here because murder records was like with sloan and so uh you know they had a little bit more of a, of a push kind of distribution but other than push. those kind of things 
yeah, they, they didn't really get it out here. So like, that's kind of, I thought, well, at the very least, if I can't do anything else, I can at least get the music from some of these people into Toronto. Um, and yeah, that was kind of part of what I wanted to do. Dope, man. Um, just, just quick. Why, why Han Solo? Why did you, uh, go with Han Solo? Like, I, I have a uh, guess, but I want to hear. Wars? I want to hear the real answer. <laughs> okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, I mean, it, it uh, at the time, um, I had like a few, kind of was thinking of a few different ideas for uh, for what to go with, um, and I guess a lot of it was sort of like sci-fi based. Uh, I had three different names that I was thinking of. Uh, Land Speed was one of them, but then I found out there was a distributor at the time that was uh, had that name, so I, I dropped that. Um, I was also a big Battlestar Galactica fan, so Starbuck Records was another thing I was thinking of. So, I never really found out about the actual coffee shop till like much, much later. So I'm kind of glad I didn't go with that because that probably would have been a big fiasco later on. Uh, and I went with Han Solo Records um, because I, I mean, I love Han Solo, but uh, also the um, the the concept to it that kind of really made me go with that was uh, i don't know if you've ever seen the star wars holiday special i but uh, i don't think i've actually watched it but i know the legend of it and uh, i've seen like a clip or two yeah. of it that it's the worst thing ever made or whatever yeah. it's pretty terrible i wouldn't really recommend it but uh there is a line in there where um <laughs> someone is trying to like pass a message along uh without anybody in the vicinity uh getting it so it's sort of coded about chewbacca and uh so they're like yeah that um that old shag rug that you ordered made by that little old lady all by hand solo is on its way something like that <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing but i was just like that's it that's the name i'm going to use so, so uh, well yeah. it definitely gives that vibe like a, the diy kind of um aesthetic or whatever it was would have been my guess as to why you chose and, and that's, Solo, I mean, that, yeah. that's part of the the um the idea of it as well right is it's like it has that like kind of double meaning in that it, it also is like uh or maybe even a triple meaning i guess because like the the label was me doing it all myself so there was like that whole idea of it being hand solo yeah but then uh also uh a lot of the the, the a lot of the element i like about like the independent hip-hop that was being made is that it was also in many cases being made by hand solo you know it was just like you know you got a spray can do that by hand solo you got the the mic you got the you know the turntables it, it's all basically you know everything could be done by like one person doing it hand solo i like it man that's that's dope um so projects wise like in the last i went over and looked at, at your band camp page there i've got the the link above us here on on screen oh, but thanks. yeah for sure um you know it's the least i can do to, to help promote all that dope yeah. canadian music man that's what i try to do with this show so uh love to love to do it but um last year you've put out projects from like chatio uh the dirty sample several different projects he had one with Azrael raps good one with sensational uh lavender and tachichi just had a drop on hand solo um old gorilla bones was i think last summer and then he's got his new one uh, again so out. two releases yeah revenge volume one and two um i think he had an instrumental one there too even in the past yeah. i don't know if it was past year or not but it, it's a lot man is is this going to continue or you got this planned for the the year to come as well are there going to be this many projects kind of deal or um i think this is an extraordinary year possibly um I, I had a little more opportunity and a little bit more, um, I guess, again, money uh, in order to be able to kind of do all this stuff. I, I think it will s slow down a tiny little bit uh, in the next year, but it still should be fairly significant, I think. Um, I, I'm, I'm hoping to kind of maintain an area of like six to eight albums in a year if I could. Nice. So, like, how far into the future do you typically plan running hand solo like do you have releases already planned for a year from now or like how does it work with independent artists because i feel like it must be a lot of people kind of making an album in their own city in their own you know studio slash bedroom whatever like doing it hand solo right and 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 you know that's got to come up kind of spontaneously on your doorstep Sometimes, i would guess yeah, yeah. it um it, i think like 
pretty much every step along the way is um, all different depending on the release and the artist. Uh, so that's also part of it. I, I do have releases that are scheduled for uh, 2024. Um, not many of them a specific date yet, but I know that, you know, they're sort of like planned to happen at that time. Um, they may not happen. Uh, they may, you know, may take a little bit longer. We'll see. But right now, that's kind of what they're planned for. So I, I do try to sort of set up a a basic outline of like what's going to come up in the next little while. But then, as you said, you know, something comes along where it's just like, hey, I've got this record and or I'm finishing off a record. And if I can fit it into the timeline and, you know, it's something I like, then, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll try to be able to do that. Um, it's a little harder to do that now with like, I've recently been working with, um, I, I didn't have distribution for a little while. Okay. Uh, so it, while it made it more difficult to kind of get the physical stuff out there, it did free me up a lot more to kind of just take on a last minute project. Now it's a little more difficult because you kind of have to have stuff in to them uh, a certain amount ahead of time. Right. And it's even more difficult if you're kind of dealing with vinyl because you know right now we're at a point where you're probably looking at four to six months to like get something like that manufactured so yeah it, so uh, like vinyl's like backed up right now it. right my understanding yeah. is the vinyl producers have been backed up and that the lathes can't keep up or whatever that the the presses i guess can't keep up yeah it's getting a little bit better but yeah it still is uh pretty bad out there like i you know i'm in, i remember when i used to press the vinyl way back in the day you know it was just like usually you're looking at a month maybe a few weeks to be able to do it and yeah now it's just so long right so can can you just talk a little bit about like what distribution actually means i mean like i have been reading articles about the industry for long enough that i get the idea but like for an independent label to have distribution um that means that you're getting people's music sent to stores. I'm right in thinking that. Yeah, that's the main uh, the main goal. Like, I mean, you've also got like um, like digital distribution as well. But those like places like uh, DistroKid and like CD Baby or whatever. Yeah. They they make it very easy for um, for anybody to kind of do that sort of thing because you can just sign up for one of those, put it on, and it obviously goes to like whatever digital streaming service. Yeah, but uh, that's yeah, about the like extent physical, of what I know about distribution. Is yeah, yeah, like... the, the physical aspect gets a little more difficult. Like uh, CD Baby was able to do that for a while, and that's partly why I didn't really have like a, a dedicated distributor. Uh, I was able to kind of rely somewhat on CD Baby, but as CD, uh, I guess as like physical sales kept falling off, CD Baby got less and less reliable in that way. Like they weren't really selling the stuff. They focused right. a lot more digital, and they, uh, you know, eventually they decided to like fairly recently close up that aspect of them. So they don't even I don't I don't think they do physical at all anymore. Um, so yeah, I had to find. Uh, I had to find somewhere else to go with in order to kind of get my stuff out there and in a better way than CD Baby. Like CD Baby was sort of half ass in the whole process, whereas, you know, you find an actual physical distributor, uh, they should be better at getting your stuff into the stores and out there for people to see. So probably like being hooked up with a physical distributor 20 years ago would have been a different thing than it is now when like HMV and kind of buying physical music was a more mainstream, big pop and thing. But I feel like now it must be kind of like there's a distributor between you and a bunch of different record stores across the country. Is that the idea? Like, because each different city is going to have a, some place to buy vinyl typically yeah. still, but they're not so, big yeah. chain stores, right? Uh, yeah, it would be like a lot more like yeah, indie stores and stuff. Uh, um, so basically, yeah, like the distributor would just have, um, have basically built relationships with these different um, buyers at the stores. And then what would happen is they um, they basically would put out, like, say, a monthly catalog or a listing of, like, this is what we have, maybe with a little bit of information from it. And then the stores might order how many of our copies they think might sell, maybe hopefully take a chance on some new stuff. Uh, I mean, it was uh, it would probably have been pretty similar back in the day as well. Uh, just that obviously um, 
maybe you might have a, of a chain that might order larger stuff. But I think on an independent scale, it probably still was dealing directly with the stores like um, HMV is not even at back at that time is probably not as likely to have taken uh, my buck 65 12 inch, for example. Right. Like, right. what are they going to do with that? Uh, and I, I know that they had like the the basements of Batman CD was available in some stores uh, like in like uh, probably Sam the Record Man and stuff. But even at that time, like back like that was like 27 years ago, I think um yeah adds up like about right yeah. 19 yeah 1996 so they were uh that cd was like about 20 dollars there whereas you could go in and you could buy like the new wu-tang clan album i think at that time i remember seeing was like i don't know 1499 so yeah. it's like who, who's gonna buy like this like 20 dollars cd of people that they don't know you gotta and, be dedicated yeah that's yeah, gotta be your exactly. homie or you must have seen his show the night before or whatever to be buying those yeah. Kind, yeah. so I, I still think even at that time it was pretty similar in that like these uh distributors were dealing mostly with like independent smaller the mom and mom pop pop type record stores yeah that's i think usually where you would find it so, um, I mean, like, they're so vital to the culture. I hope that, you know, people do continue to support those kind of stores or whatever, because um, that is where you'll find indie music. And, uh, you know, uh, like now people can go obviously buy a digital online. But I think that there is something nice about being able to go into a record store and flip through uh, different albums and, you know, see what's out there kind of presented to you all in one space. Well, I, I think even like just, you know, this aside from the the idea of like going to a record store and buying it like to me just like being able to like hold that record that cd that cassette and, and like you know open it up like to me from like my youth being able to like look at the liner notes yeah. and like just while i'm listening to the music looking at that actual item that i have you know uh it adds like a, a whole new level to things rather than just totally. kind of sitting on the computer sort of like listening to something play yeah, I agree totally. Um, like I, I was somebody who was just the same way, looking through liner notes, you know, buying physical albums to to find new artists or whatever. Before the internet is what it is now, that was the only way to do it. That or like you know, magazines and uh, you know, I guess little blog posts were starting to pop up and stuff. But like, um, you know, like before before the internet was was what it is now. It was an era where you had to be tapped in like that. So yeah. Yeah, you know, like it was either flipping through albums at the HMV or um, just talking to other people, you know, maybe your friend's older brother knew new music that you didn't know or whatever. But uh, it's it's something where now in the modern era, I still try to encourage people. And like it's been something I've had to rekindle in myself, even with at sick is is that digging mentality where like you can go deeper online now than just listening to the album. Like if, yeah. if I see somebody's name, I'm looking at their social media. I'm trying to get a grasp of like, who the fuck is this person? Where are they from? You know, like who are they collaborating with all the same stuff that you would do in, in a liner notes or whatever it's out yeah. there. It's just, it's more scattered onto six different social media platforms or whatever at this point. Um, yeah. Yeah. I remember the days back when you had liner notes was like, that was the information you had to go on, on like figuring out stuff about that person, maybe who they were down with and who, you know, might be somebody else to kind of go and check out because, oh, they're mentioned, you know, they're thanked in the liner notes or they're like a feature on this album. And, and that was how you had to do it. And like even especially like when I when I was doing reviews back at that time, too, uh, that's the information that I had was like whatever I'm they might have put in their little bio that they sent with. Yeah. It, uh, and what was on the album, whereas like now, yeah, like when I towards the end of me writing reviews with the internet, I could go in and I could like look this kind of stuff up and where are they from? Like, make sure am I spelling the names of like things correctly and, and everything, you know, like it, yeah, it was a very different world back then. That's for sure. I kind of miss it in a way, but you know, I guess we're moving forward and there's good things about now. Yeah. you Like I was saying, you just, if it's there still like the ability to find new artists and dig into their background, it's still there. It just takes a little bit different type of engagement where it is sitting on a computer, digging through, through background or whatever but like you know um atsic has really made me do that and i'm i'm so glad that it has because five years ago i wouldn't have been able to name 20 canadian hip-hop artists and yeah. now i'm following hundreds of them or whatever so 
Um, I will say though, one big thing I really miss is the reviews. Yeah. Like I I used to love going and getting like the source or rap pages or like Vice magazine or even you know in Canada getting like Word, um, uh, Exclaim. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of things, and you just go through and like you know see what people were were saying about different things and discovering the music through that. And, Definitely. You know, nowadays, because like you can just listen to it anywhere, you just. The, the whole like what someone else thinks of it and writes it, it is not as important. So uh, I find that uh, I don't get to see reviews as much, which I would really like. I always enjoyed reading them. And, you know, also from a record label perspective, it's just like, you know, I wish I could send my stuff out and more people would review it because I, I miss hearing that kind of feedback of like what people actually thought of the album. Yeah, now you get like, you know, hip hop Twitter where people are arguing about like, you know, what the best album is or... The, like it's little short review blurbs from everybody yeah. with an opinion in the world right and it's not in one centralized place uh so it's you know you gotta like you're you're only reading about that one artist it's tougher to to also yeah, then flip exactly. the page and find you know the next artist or whatever right yeah yeah um i mean lately just to to plug what i've been doing lately like with every episode of at sick i've also been making a post at dubious.com where I wouldn't say I'm reviewing things because like, I don't like to be that critical about art, but everything I'm playing, I endorse. So I figure like, well, let me type up three little sentences about everything here just to have something out there. And then if somebody yeah. needs a quote for a fucking grant or whatever else, like they can say like, Hey, this guy who does a radio show said this about it or whatever. Like, cause it's tough. I think getting media when you're an upcoming artist who is just dropping music on Spotify or whatever to the world. But like, I'm trying to tap in and, and put that in one spot so that people who are looking for that spot can, can come, you know, find it on at every week or whatever. And yeah, you know. I remember you saying that in one of the other interviews I was, uh, I was checking out from you and I thought that was a really great idea to, uh, to do not just, not just for the artists and the labels, but I think also, that could be useful for someone who's just kind of like scanning through your your playlist to kind of decide, you know, am I going to check this out? And yeah, you know, just getting a bit of an idea of, of what they're hearing. Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. Um, what is it that you look for in music? Like, are you still real tapped in in new music or uh, do you kind of busy with running hand solo yeah, and don't get I, a chance? I, I wish um, I um yeah, I don't have as much time as I used to to be able to kind of just go and, and listen to music. And uh, I will admit, like, since I stopped doing reviews, like, um, writing the reviews just to take up a lot of time. And I was finding myself kind of going from the enjoyment of it and, and sharing this uh, this music that I liked. It started to become too much of a job where it was just like, you know, I'm, I'm having to, I got to sit down and I got to write these reviews tomorrow because they're due tomorrow. And... So uh, and it was also kind of taking up my time from doing my record label. So I had to kind of look at what I was going to end up doing. So at that time, I ended up stopping writing music reviews. And that was a great way to hear a lot of music. And so, you know, I, I don't I don't have the um, the time to kind of, like you said, go and search everything out. So yeah, it, it makes it a little more difficult. I also don't have the time to listen to a lot of stuff. Like I've I've bought a bunch of music that I still haven't even like put in the deck or put on the turntable. It's just sort of sitting there waiting, and you know, it's just the the focus is too much on what I've got to do. Like you know, I I have to every album that I put out. You know, I'll go through and listen to it multiple times because like I'm want to make sure like all are this is the radio edits are they all actually clean or was something missed right i gotta possibly write the uh the album blurb for it so i gotta listen to like each of these like singles that come out the album you know <laughs> put all that together so that i can't even of, imagine that it would mostly be my so label much stuff. yeah yeah um, yeah i mean i wish i could listen to more but i just it, it's difficult to find the time so do you do kind of a and r side of running hand solo too like are you a one-man show at hand solo or are there yes. other people okay yes. so so yeah, you're handling hand you're yeah, handling the a and r side then too you're finding who you want to to back on the label right like it's it's not like you have kind of four artists that you've been backing for the last 20 years and 
you know it, it is a bit of that um like i mean like uh you mentioned earlier to chichi and lavender right uh, to chichi was a very early artist on the label like back in like i think 90 i want to say 98 was probably the first release that we did with him okay. uh his like suicidal soul 12 inch vinyl so and um a lot of like some of the other people like I, i've known dirty sample even before he started working on the label i knew him through my my reviews so like right. i had got a lot of his stuff like back when he was planning i got like some stuff from him to review and i was playing it on like i i had uh, an online radio show back way back Dope. um so you know i was playing a lot of that kind of stuff so this is like uh, some of these people like Chadio and Azrael, I, I reviewed their uh, Imagination's Tree Trunk stuff for quite a while for Exclaim and played a lot of that stuff on my radio show or my internet show. So some of these people are just people that I've kind of listened to for a while. So I, I know that I like them and they eventually, you know, lately, I guess they also know that, OK, I got great reviews uh, from from me at that time. So, yeah, here's someone, you know, you, you got a label, let's approach you and do it. Um, some some of the other ones though yeah like I, i'll get some people sending me music to kind of uh see if i might like it uh, also like five dollar rap show that we were doing with uh like me more or less and word burglar we did that for almost 10 years uh we were about to celebrate our 10-year anniversary when COVID hit right so that has also been like a place to sort of be a and r um, meet new up and coming artists yeah. yeah like that that's how um that's how ultra magnus got on the label like i saw him perform a couple of times there he did like two uh two months in a row which was a very rare thing and both times he just blew me away and i was just like all right i gotta do some more work with this guy and then that's also how i hooked up with mickey o'brien he came out to one of our like uh was, i think he was playing i can't remember who was playing the show i think he was but uh yeah he came there and like was um very vocal about his interest in being on hand solo and uh and so you know nice made it happen yeah pants. <laughs> yeah so uh I mean, it was nice he had the cosign from fresh kills as well so that definitely helped you know someone that i've also known and worked with for a while yeah cosigns go a long ways um you know when when you yeah. see somebody working with somebody else who you kind of know and trust the output from it's uh it's a lot easier to get them in the door whether it's into a label's ears or a listener's ears or whatever i think um you know like that whole collaborative aspect is one of my favorite things of hip-hop because you can discover Agreed. new artists i think like with bands like i guess it's you know they share show bills and you check out the other bands that are playing with them or whatever but in in hip-hop there's the actual studio element where you're featuring this artist or you're rapping on this guy's beat or whatever um and it, it just is so easy to find different artists that way um but yeah man uh do you ever actually help artists that you're you're that are on your label to find new producers or find new mcs to work with like do you oh, yeah you've got your hand in the mix that way too yeah i mean again every single release is extremely different in how it's approached so like sometimes uh i'll have people who just like Mickey O'Brien is very self-efficient in a lot of ways. So he'll basically like, you know, he keeps me in the loop the whole way uh, across things. But like, I, it's rare when I'm kind of gonna have to set him up with a producer. I mean, I know he's gonna be working with like Fresh Kills. Um, he's gonna set up who he wants to, to rap with on those things. But even with that being said, I mean, I, I've still, I still have kind of like hooked him up with some people for remixes. Like I, he's had like DJ Matto and uh, the Dirty Sample, two people I like to go to for remixes. Yeah, they've done stuff like that for him. Um, you know, I think that on uh, on his first album that we did, he did a song that involved uh, Mighty Rhino, uh, which was me kind of suggesting that. Um, so I, you know, I do try to kind of I I as much as I don't like. I'm not really into No Limit Records, but I do really like the the element of what they did where you would get like the album, any album would have like loads of other No Limit artists on it. And yeah. I liked how, you know, they seem like a big kind of crew. And so for me, I always loved the idea of you're on Han Solo Records, let's 
pop some other Han Solo records dudes on your tracks and let's see what kind of mix we get. Yeah. And, you know, same with like some of the producers and things and just like, you know, I, I, I'd like to, as much as possible, kind of like give a, um, a feeling of like togetherness, crewness, whatever, Definitely. of like the label that, you know, like any of these people might pop up on somebody else's label. Or yeah. somebody else's album. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, I like the, that aspect when when labels do that. I'm uh, the same as you. Not a huge No Limit fan, but like you know, Wu Tang did that same thing. Everybody's yeah. solo albums was full of the other artists or whatever. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think that that's a very good look and and yeah, good way to find new music or whatever. Do you ever end up like in studio with with artists as they're recording the, these albums? Like, have you been part of the process that way for any of these? Um. Not really. I mean, especially nowadays. I mean, you you get a lot of times maybe they're um, you know they're not always recorded with people together. Uh, I'm working with people across Canada, so I'm not uh, the number of people that I'm working with in Toronto maybe are uh, are smaller. So yeah, you know, there's no way I'm going to be in studio for something where like the Dirty Sample is working with like Azrael. Azrael, yeah. Uh, oh, West. Yeah. You know, that was probably Azrael taking the beats and doing his thing in his own studio anyway and stuff. Yeah, file but, share, um, file sharing changed the game totally or whatever. Yeah, but, exactly. I yeah. mean, I have been I have been in studio when different people have been recording stuff probably oddly enough more when it's not on my label <laughs> than otherwise like I, I have been there for a lot of stuff to be recorded that's you know come out on all kinds of other labels Where, um do that? i have been occasionally for my own stuff but yeah it's it's pretty rare and like you know nowadays uh i just don't have it, it's more difficult for me you know, at my age to kind of like, you know, go out and sit in a studio for a whole while while people are recording stuff. I, yeah. I also know enough of how boring that's probably going to be after a while, too. <laughs> it's fun for the artists, but not so much for me. The people sitting like on the couch watching. There. Yeah, <laughs> totally. No, I just kind of wondered, like, even have you had kind of, you know, executive producer kind of a role or like any creative input at all? Because I think you did at one yeah. point tell me you have you used to make rap yourself didn't you didn't you tell me that a little bit i've done a, like i've done a few rap yeah, songs here yeah yeah like i remember that. you sending yeah. me links from some old stuff or whatever but yeah, i mean i i do think that like um i do provide executive production elements on some things like the uh the dirty sample and the sensational album was uh, a lot of me behind the scenes like that you know i got an opportunity to work with sensational to put out an album yeah so for that it was just like i wanted to pair them up from somebody uh with somebody from hand solo records to kind of give it that hand solo records feel and so uh the dirty sample made a lot of sense uh, i know he's got like dope dusty beats but they also are uh they tend to be a little bit quirky right and i knew that that's kind of um that's kind of one of the things that sensational likes is sort of like lo-fi quirkiness so you know i was very unorthodox to, uh, style that dude so yeah, yeah yeah exactly so that was something i kind of linked up and was like involved in putting together a lot of it i mean i i couldn't really go to sensational's been around for a long time and you know he's he's got his way of being so am i, I right really in thinking he in, was like part of the jungle brothers like the he was he was uh yeah he was involved something? with the jungle brothers for their third <laughs> album okay um, yeah he was like heavily on the crazy wisdom masters album that got shelved because it was too um too weird too crazy so some of the songs <laughs> right. from it ended up getting like kind of redone a little bit and ended up on the next album but uh a lot of the stuff was not his stuff he is on one song uh, i think it's called 40 below trooper which okay. got a video and was a single so you can kind of see him back then when he was going by the name torture so but, yeah uh, my, this is one of those situations where all i know about the artist is what i read in the bio or whatever and there was, yeah, there was yeah. mention of that so cool my, to hear my more. discovery of him was like with word sound when um when i was really into that label and um and i've just kind of followed him along since then so it's just the opportunity to be able to do something with him on my label was you know i kind of had to jump on it had to do it it took a long time it was you know there was um a lot of it wasn't the easiest thing to make happen along the way, but yeah. uh, I'm, I'm extremely proud with how it turned out. I, I think it's great, and uh, and I, I'm glad that we were able to make this happen and, and work out. 
Nice. Hey, can I ask you not to transition from talking about sensational specifically, but just about any artists in general? Um, are are indie artists tough to work with? I just I know in my own personal experience, indie artists are are. Um, you know, indie art gets backburnered a lot. Life comes up and, <laughs> and people duck out and it's not always easiest to get um, artists who aren't making a ton of money doing these things to come out and do things and be where they're supposed to be at certain times or meet deadlines or whatever else, right? Um, it, it's got to be a little it, bit tough, I think. Yeah, I would say, again, it's like it's a broad range of, you know, fluctuating in there. So like, you know, some, some are better at meeting deadlines and, you know, doing things than others might be. Um, I think with, with like with hand solo, there's a pretty wide range. Like I've, I've worked with some people who might kind of like are doing this more just as a, a passionate hobby, maybe. Yeah. Whereas I'll also be working with some people who are, um, you know, hardcore trying to to make this their job and, you know, be successful with the music that they want to make. And so, you know, I think that a lot of it can kind of depend on maybe where you fall within that spectrum. Yeah. Uh, some people are more responsible than other people. Like I've definitely, I've, you know, I've booked interviews for people where they've fallen through because the person hasn't shown up, which you know, is uh, not great, not just for the artist, but like, you know, how, how many times is that going to happen before the DJ might go, I don't want to do an interview because you're not a reliable label anymore. Um, so, you know, there's stuff like that. You got a lot of leeway over here, man. I understand when artists don't show up. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. I, I would say the biggest issue, though, is uh, is definitely deadlines for music. Like, that, that is the hardest thing. Uh, you get, like... A lot of like, yeah, I mean, they're artists, so, you know, uh, they got to work on their own time. They want to make sure it, it's up to uh, their standards that they want to release. So, yeah. you know, it can be difficult when you say, here's a deadline. This is what we need it to be because we got to, like, make the vinyl in order to get it to the distributor by this point in time so that we can meet what that deadline is. And, and so sometimes that just doesn't happen, you know. And I mean, uh, sometimes, I guess, is the wrong word. Quite often, that <laughs> tends to be the way it happens. And uh, it, it can be frustrating. It can be kind of annoying. Um, but, you know, it, it's what you've got to do to deal with it. And well, it's just a matter of trying to, like, I, I, try to, I try to keep, a lot of my job, I think, is trying to kind of keep reminders towards people, right? Saying, you know, like, okay, we got to get this done now. Can you get that to me soon? Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't always work. And sometimes, you know, things are going in a little bit late and having to kind of rejuggle things. Yeah. But, you know, what can you do? It's the, the world of independent artists, like you said, that are, are, you know, I'm not paying them. So, you know, it's not like it's necessarily their their job. Like, I'm, you know, you're on some kind of like hourly pay and you got to do your work. Yeah. Yeah. When there's no threat of being fired, it becomes a different thing where people just have to be doing it because they want to be doing it, um, honestly. But yeah. Uh, I mean, we know like an art, you know, there a lot of these people, there are artists who, um, their thing is to make this art, not necessarily to, uh, you know, some kind of businessy aspect of things totally. where it's just like, you know, uh, art happens when art happens. And, you know, people also, they have their own lives to, to have to, you know, in many cases, you got to work another job or even, even if you're not working another job, maybe, you know, you're the producer who also, your studio is being used to record things and you're mixing other people's stuff. And so, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons that sometimes are justifiable to why there could be these delays. And sometimes it's just, there could be the occasional pure laziness. <laughs> well, and sometimes shit just gets real too, right? Like, I don't know how yeah. many people have like, you know, sometimes your life falls apart as you're trying to put an album together. And, um, the, it's tough oh, yeah. to get that album out anymore. You know, well, I, I've had plenty of like, there's been plenty of albums that have been like scheduled for me to, to do. And, they've fallen apart for, you know, whatever reason life gets in the way, the group breaks up, um, you know, they decide to stop rapping and, you know, do something else. Like, yeah, I, the, I, I could have like a whole huge catalog of other releases that, you know, Almost. in some other, in some other alternate universe, you know, 
the the record label has like a whole different catalog of all these albums that actually did get finished yeah man i, I mean as much as as like sometimes like you said it must feel like you're pestering all these artists sometimes or like you know just constantly there with the reminders for them trying to keep people on point on on I think probably a lot of artists would feel very grateful for someone doing that for them as well, because like you said, uh, just from doing these interviews and from the artists I've met throughout my life, I know that a lot of artists who make the art that I like anyways are not so business minded. They, they're they not trying to to be the businessman. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, having somebody like you in their corner probably helps them out immensely because then you've got you know they get to keep their mind clear for the art side and let somebody else handle most of the promotion and stuff um but i, I definitely do feel like an annoying asshole sometimes but i, I hope that i am doing good <laughs> no i'm i'm sure that they're they're they've they've got to be happy or they wouldn't be coming to you uh but i think like <sighs> For, for them, they talk about the cathartic release. They talk about the, oh, I love art because it's it's just therapy for me or I need to express these thoughts or I'd go crazy if I didn't or whatever. I'm hearing all these things and um, that's their reward for it. What, what's your reward, man? Like what keeps you doing this? Um, Overall... Because it's got to be a lot. <laughs> okay. It, it's, yeah, I mean, like, um, I, I would say, like, the, the original reason I got into doing this was because with the Halifax artists, I just, I wanted to, I, I thought, I love this music, and I want more people to hear it. And I could be a part of that chain of helping more people hear it. And whether it was with my record label whether it was with me uh, writing reviews or whether it was with me doing my, like, DJing my shows. Um, all of that was just a me, a way of me being able to share music that I liked to, um, to the world, I guess, or whoever, you know, might possibly want to hear from me. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I, it's, it still is that with this record label. It's just, you know, these are, these are people that I think um, I'd like to share their music with. And it's, it makes me feel good when I can see things that I've done, I guess, have maybe had an effect on it where, you know, I can see that, okay, I've been working hard to kind of promote this thing, say, on some Spotify. And I can see that, yeah, it's getting, you know, a good number of Spotify plays or, you know, somebody writes a review and it can be like, okay, you know, great. Somebody else recognizes the the greatness of this album that yeah. I, you know, got out there for somebody. And so to me, you know, it, it's, yeah, it, it's just seeing people like what I have been able to share with them and, and being, I guess, the middleman that can get this stuff out. Cause you know, it, it might be difficult for some of these people to to do this otherwise in terms of like you know getting it done or just like having having like they'd probably release it themselves somewhere along the line but like you know in, in what in what way yeah and, like you, you said know, distro kid is easy enough album. but it's easy yeah. enough to get your album to spotify and have it sit there and get no plays at all and not really make any splash yeah. or whatever yeah um like they talk about how before somebody releases something, they should have kind of like a rollout in order. Do, do you, I mean, I see, you know, you're generally doing at least three singles before an album drops kind of like there'll be three, three single drops that gets sent out. Uh, yeah. What else is part of your rollout plan leading up to, to one of these albums? Uh, again, it can kind of depend on the release and like, you know, who, who I'm dealing with and uh what they can put into it but um i mean in general i would probably say yeah it's the three uh the three singles that i will try to put out and promote closer to the album i'll usually try to um to get like interviews lined up for them as you're obviously aware i'm sure you hear about me but hear from me like pretty much yeah we've album. done a few of those yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um in, in some cases you know trying to uh, trying to see what I can do to help out with from their side with like what they need in terms of like marketing, uh, you know, like 
can you know uh can we go on tour um can you you know are you going to make a video how can we kind of like make this sort of thing happen uh you know it could just kind of depend a little bit um again from person to person but primarily i would say it's like putting those singles out trying to like uh promote those singles to spotify playlists to yeah. blogs see what kind of like reviews can possibly come in for those things get it onto the uh the radio for them to be playing um kind of like sort of build up a bit of hype about the album coming out before it comes out uh and then you know doing those interviews those are probably the main uh, the main things I do for like promo and push before an album comes out. I mean, there's also, I guess, like, you know, behind the scenes, just kind of preparing, you know, uh, when this thing has to be and getting it into the distributor and yeah, totally. you know, getting, getting the artwork all put together, et cetera, you know, that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah getting the files lined up to be sent off and everything. Um, yeah. So you didn't mention social media. How important is social media to your promo game? Uh, I mean, I, I, I I do use social media, um, you know, as much as I kind of hate being on it and being there. It, it's, you know, if I didn't have this record label, I would probably try to uh, cut back on pretty much most, if not all, social media. I, you know, it's it can also be kind of a bit of a drain. I do find myself right. staring at my phone more than I probably need to. <laughs> but at the same time, it, it is an important place to go and share uh, share the stuff. But I don't really know how much of an impact it really has. Like, I, I don't know if, you know, me sharing on Facebook, for example, that, you know, this new single out is out. If it's really it making somebody go and, like, listen to the single or buy the single or go over to, like, Spotify and, like, stream it or anything like that. So, you know, I, I don't have the figures for that kind of thing. I just, you know, it, it I, I'm hoping that it does like i mean it seems to me that it's more likely that it would than you know if i don't do it at all yeah so you know i you will know, say like the different platforms seem you know like at least on a facebook post there is a link there for somebody who is interested to click it the thing that pisses me off most with social media is right now instagram seems to be the most popular one and it's like okay but you can only post pictures there you can't fucking link in the you know description you're I writing on include, there like, I, I know a lot of people kind of put like see the link in my bio which i can't really do that because like i mean you know the, the bio is not you know we're like my my thing would be like a link tree of like every single album i put out which is just be kind of insane yeah and in every video and whatever so like but I, I do try to include like in every post the link so you can cut and paste it hopefully at least but what i do like to do a lot with uh with Instagram is I'll post the, um, you know, maybe post the album cover and say that it's out. And then I like to usually turn it into a story at least right. where from there you can kind of put a link into it. You can put the music, some music from it in there and, you know, hopefully people will kind of notice it in that way. So yeah, yeah, know, that it makes sense. another way to kind of do it. Totally. Um, do you ever fuck with paid promo on these apps uh that's something that you know I, i've seen various artists do uh various labels sometimes pop up with the sponsored post or whatever on on ig I, I or have, facebook i have dabbled in it with facebook a little bit at times but uh i don't know that it really it didn't seem to make a huge difference yeah i uh, you know so I, I just kind of have sort of stopped doing that and um you know see I, see where things go i i just find like you know uh to me i'd rather um i'd rather kind of my my idea is more so constant um constant posts of of content yeah. than to like you know advertise something so like you know i i guess i could sort of the, you know here the new album is out and then like do a sponsored ad for for a little while but like you know what i would rather do is say here's the album out and then like maybe you know two days later go oh thanks to like you know this guy for putting it on your spotify list oh here's like you know uh, a review of of it from like this thing and and just try to um to kind of like provide more new content for each yeah uh, each here it is charting on the college radio uh, yeah those kind of posts yeah totally yeah that's probably a good look too man um so 
judging from what you're sitting in front of and from what you've been telling me about the last, you know, 25 years of running Han Solo, I'm guessing you probably have one of the dopest, you know, hip hop record collections in the country. Like you've, you've probably been stacking vinyl for, for years and have all sorts of releases that are rare and whatnot. Am I writing that assumption I, I behind I, you? I, I wish I could say yes, but it probably isn't exactly that. I mean, uh i've i've had to i've had to purge stuff quite often okay um like my my cd collection has at times been quite large because uh when i was writing music reviews i would get a lot of cds every month but then that also meant that i had to kind of there's only so much space that i would have so i would have to like get rid of stuff every once in a while and the you'd get like some really dope new stuff. So you'd have to maybe get rid of some like kind of whatever older stuff. Um, so yeah, my, I would probably say a good portion of like what I have is stuff that um, I, I would probably be willing to listen to straight through for the most part. So um, I do have, um, I do have some rare things, probably some extremely rare things, uh, both in CD and cassette. Um, I do have like my my Canadian stuff is like well, I guess especially my Canadian CDs are pretty decent in size because like I that's one of the things that was very hard. Like if I would purge, I found it very difficult to to purge Canadian stuff. Yeah. Um, even if it's stuff that I didn't real don't really listen to a lot, it's just like I just I don't know for some reason. Uh, I've just felt such a connection to this kind of stuff. Like, you it know, should be archived I mean, somewhere, of, man. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. part of part of my record label was like I've like worked with some American artists, but like you know, my my thing was all about like from the beginning, like with Basements of Batman, it was just like, okay, this is a Halifax hip hop compilation. That was the first album I released, and I was I was envisioning Basements of Batman as being kind of like a uh, a series that would focus on different cities. Uh, and my thought wasn't like American cities. My thought was Canadian cities. Like, let's, you know, show what's going on in these different cities. And, you know, Basements of Batman 2 was going to be um, Vancouver. Uh, but, you know, the the whole thing sort of changed. Um, and that didn't really happen. Basements of Batman 2 is more just like a variety of music from different places. But, like, that was my thing. It's just like, you know, Canadian hip hop is what I, I really want to represent, what I want more people to be able to hear yeah and so and and that was even what i wrote about a lot that's a lot of what i would play on my shows and so for me it's just like you know i i getting rid of it just seems difficult you know it just doesn't seem right and yeah, and no. so i but uh, at the same time too there's been like a big period where um i haven't really purchased much music you know um once i was so used to getting free stuff and with the, the occasional purchase here and there, uh, I just, it's, I, you know, I would never be able to purchase the same amount of stuff that I was like getting for free. Getting, yeah, and, same too. you know, my, my money right now too, is just like, you know, I could buy a bunch of stuff, but then like, you know, who's paying for like uh, a new album on like hand solo records, right? Yeah. Like I gotta, I would rather save Responsibilities. Like yeah. something. Yeah. You know, I, I would rather release somebody's album than buy like a whole pile of like, new music that yeah. um you know it, it's it's tough i gotta make that decision and you know unfortunately that's what i i have to do so so it uh yeah. um so for for people to support music these days um do you still tell them that they should buy music or has have we well, as an industry move beyond it like i mean i i you know it, it doesn't matter to me right like i mean i i, I love uh, I love as often as possible. I have there's very few uh, records on Han Solo that are not in some physical format. I did play around with for a little while. I was trying to do like um, just put out some free digital albums. Uh, I did that for maybe a year or two. There was like a few here and there, but then um, you know, it's just to me. I just I really like having something physical, you know, yeah. uh, whether it's I, you know, I don't even care like CD, cassette, vinyl. Uh, it's just it's nice to have something tangible. So I would love people to buy those things because they would get them out of my house. That would be really nice. Um, I've got like a huge storage room filled with like back catalog. So, you know, please, if you love physical, 
go and buy some of my music. Hell yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, to me, I, it doesn't matter. Like, especially, like, I guess as long as I would prefer if people are not pirating it, I guess, is the thing. Uh, and I, I wish that streaming services did pay more money for things. But, like, you know, if that's your way that you want to listen to music is by going and streaming it you know go for it go and stream it you know like i i understand that there's you know not everybody now listens to physical stuff not yeah. everybody has a cd player or you know can take the time to put a record on a turntable and flip it over or whatever so you know do what you do but you know um obviously i make more money and so do the artists make more money from a, a, a physical sale i am very appreciative of those people who do consistently uh buy the music in physical format um, but you know, I can't, I can't tell somebody that's how you should be doing it. It's, you know, <laughs> you know what I can do though, is I, I will tell fans that they should be showing support and showing love in some way because, um, artists are going to make more music. If, if there's more people paying attention to it, if they see people commenting and liking their stuff more often, they're, they're just, they're, they're going to feel like they need to make more yeah. music. If they see I mean, people I, at their shows, they're going to feel like they need to make more well, music. I, I definitely so. agree. I mean, I, I think there's, you know, if, if like you don't, if you don't buy physical um, music, and you prefer to stream. I mean, I think that there's still other ways that you can definitely support those artists. You know, share that music with your friends. Uh, you know, post about it. If there's an album that you like and you are only streaming it, cool. But like, you know, maybe share that um, yeah. uh, that Spotify link or pop it into a uh, a playlist and share that playlist. Let people know about who who these people are. Yeah. Uh, go see them live when they come to your show. Maybe buy a T-shirt, right? Like if they, you know, if they have a T-shirt on their band camp or something like that, pick one of those up. Like there's, there Definitely. are other ways that you can support more than just like, you know, buying a CD. Totally. And, and you know, so I, I, to me, it's just like, you know, do, if you like an artist, you know, there are, there aren't many ways to support. I always Find feel like I'm harping on this or whatever. Like I ask everybody I interview this same basic question, like how should people support or whatever. But and and like I'm sure it's repetitive for some people who have listened to multiple interviews. But at the same time, <laughs> I know that there are people out there who just don't think about it in that way. Yeah. They think that they're streaming the music and whatever. That guy must get paid somehow. Like he's rapping about money well, it's or a, whatever. It's a, so it's he a must new world, right? Well. Like. You know, for me, I remember when you had to go to the store and you had to buy something, you had to potentially, you know, line up for it or even get to the store uh, early or you might it might be sold out. And so, you know, there was there was a lot more emphasis on on how you got that music and making sure you got it. And now people are you know i don't know maybe spoiled isn't exactly the right word but you know that's the type of thing that it is like it's there it's everywhere and yeah you you know like you're not really paying for it you might pay for a subscription to like whatever service that you like to yeah. use and and then you have any kind of music on your fingertips so it's you know it's understandable that people don't you know the the average person doesn't really consider you know how much is like this particular artist making on this and you know am i supporting them like you know it's just music feels free people just, in this yeah day music day, music right? is, you know people like music music is free i'm gonna just listen to it you know i'm i'm, I'm paying for it because i've got my spotify account or whatever you know and and you know, if they're listening to the you know big name mainstream platinum artists sure those guys are still making their money from whatever i don't know their endorsements yeah, or whatever going, else. No, they're doing they're doing a tour and people are going and paying you know how much ever money to go and see the tour because yeah. yeah they're big enough the label's gonna back them for a tour but if if you're looking to support people who are you know coming up and making independent music it's all very important so uh i'm gonna keep asking people this question and i, appreciate uh, I, I think it's a very val valuable thing to do it um i think that it doesn't hurt for people to hear every week that, uh, you know, hey, support support your independent artists so they can continue to make the music that you're enjoying. Hell yeah, man. Uh, I think you're in a unique position. Another question I ask everybody is to describe their local scene. Um, I would be open to hearing you talk about Toronto, but I, I think you're in a unique position as someone who's been paying a lot of attention to the entire national scene in Canada. Can you describe the Canadian hip hop scene? Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's more difficult than, um, than I wish. Uh, I, 
going back to what we talked about really early on in the show, I don't feel that I'm as tapped in uh, to what is currently going on as um, as I used to be. So you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of new people coming up that I am just 100% not aware of. Sure. Uh, unfortunately, like you know, even even a, a good number of the people that I tend to work with are people who've been doing it for a while. So it, it it's kind of it's kind of hard to say. Like even the uh, the Toronto scene itself, which I'm like right here and in, um, I'm just I'm not as uh, I'm not as aware of everything that's going on. Like I you know there's people that I see here and there. Uh, I may go to a show and discover some new people, but uh, primarily like you know the last shows that I've gone to have all been you know indie rap shows uh, made up of people that I all how about, that I like pretty much all of and all know of. So how yeah. about let me rephrase it then? Can instead of describing it as it is now, can can you describe the scene from like as a as a retrospect over the past uh, years of running Han Solo like. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I can I can provide, I guess, a little bit of info. Like for me, uh, looking back on a lot of that stuff is very nostalgic. And it was a very exciting period. Like when I, when I started Hand Solo Records and probably, you know, the the first 10 years after that. Uh, and I mean, you know, probably prior to that as well for a little while. But it was just it was a very exciting creative period and, and, a, and a time when like um, you were seeing a lot of these like small indie scenes in these different towns sort of trying to connect with each other and there was a lot of um a lot of camaraderie and and trying to like see what you could do to like pull them all together so you know like i i remember uh you know like fritz the cat trying to like um do his uh his like i guess like record list um like he would buy records from like different places and kind of like try to sell them or i guess get them on consignment and sell them through his zine and stuff okay uh and and so it was just kind of like you know here's a way like there's all these like dope little scenes all across canada and all these small towns you know and with like little you know little record labels sort of similar to hand solo records you know like a peanuts and corn and you had like you know joe run records out in like you know halifax and like just different things in each place and they were all like their own little scenes but it was just like everybody kind of was on the same page and how how you could pull all of these things together and you know canada being this like big place very relatable thoughts difficult yes. to tour and so it's just like you know how can we like you know try to create this like uh, ability to tour across where like you can go to the city and you know you can do a show and you know that somebody will like put you up for the night or whatever right and yeah. and so it was like it was really great to sort of see everybody at that level trying to work together to to help each other and, and create new ways to to try to like really um really make the canadian hip-hop scene shine whether it be like okay i'm gonna try to like you know we need a distribution kind of set up here so you know let's do this and oh we need mastering so you know who would step up and kind of like take on and, and do these kind of things and you know the the talk at that time always being like canada canada has dope music but the problem was always we don't have an infrastructure right and we still don't have an infrastructure to be able to make all this stuff happen you know it's just like it, it it's tried and it's tried but like nothing really solidifies well enough to do that and that would be the one thing that i could say about the current scene is that you know it's still we're missing all of that kind of stuff there's not like there's not a lot of like i mean there's more than there used to be but there's still not a lot of urban radio there's right. like way less urban like magazines or urban like uh websites that are around to be able to like promote this kind of stuff uh, if you're if you're in Canada, it's still it's still a huge slog to be able to to get your name out there, and it's still like even even after Drake blew up, you know, it, it's still uh, it's still a wasteland for people who Canadians that don't listen or don't care about Canadian rap music. You know, it's just like yeah, Drake, he's from Toronto, but do you know another person like that raps in Canada? It's just like. Nah. Mercules. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe that, you know, like, yeah. although I don't know if like the typical 
Drake listener is going to no, no, no. I might not have a ton of crossover, but, but maybe so. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah, that's the thing. It's just like you know, um, we we should have a bigger scene across Canada um, after all this time, and it's it's not there. And I I that was like one of you know the goals that we always wanted to try to to do. I know like a lot of people sort of involved in that in their own different ways, trying to make that happen. And yeah, uh, it know, takes a lot of hands it. pushing from all different angles. I think to yeah. to roll that rock up the hill, man. That's uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we've been crushed a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, we just keep trying, right? So yeah, here, yeah, here we are. Yeah, it's, exactly. Everything you said is very relatable to you know what I'm trying to do with after the smoke is clear and fly information. It's all just spread love and spread. Uh, the culture and build those those connections with people or whatever um yeah and that's why i always love seeing that kind of thing you know it's just like every every new person that steps up to do something like that is one more uh link in that in that armor um and you know and that's why i also like i hate seeing things kind of go defunct and disappear you know like it's always sad to see a magazine close up or you know, a website yeah. shut down or uh, someone move on from a radio show. I understand that they have to happen, but like, you know, it's just like that's one more lost thing. And I'd like to see it constantly moving forward. Definitely. Uh, in, let's take some giant steps instead of these like, you know, little tiny baby steps. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, So you did mention that like most of the artists on Han Solo are kind of artists you've known for a while and been around for the legacy. Um, a, lot of, a lot of them, yeah. What about new artists? Are you, do you look, do, well, you said you don't like look actively, but um, if there's a new artist watching this and they're like, this sounds like a guy that I want to be down with, could they get it on? Like, should they be sending you music? Yeah, I mean, I, um, uh, I'll i be honest, I don't check everything that, that comes through my way, but like, sure. um, I, I have had people who like will contact me, uh, you know, through like different social media ways and will like maybe send links to youtube videos or like a spotify link or something and if i have some time i'll check them out uh a lot of times uh, it's not really my thing yeah um you know like whether it's like some somebody new or somebody that's been around for a while like for me what uh what really draws me to the music is something you know that they're doing that's unique uh that's that's kind of like less i've always liked weird yeah, but like you know, um, as I get older, maybe you know, I'm I'm less, um, less into like just weird for being weird kind of thing, uh, and and you know, I, I would prefer to have a little better like um, with the stuff that I'm releasing now, maybe a little bit better sound quality than maybe I, I would have been willing to kind of go with before. Right. But you know, for me, it's just like you know, even if it's something like modern and new, I want something that's going to be kind of different and weird. Uh, you know, someone that's kind of doing their own thing. And so I, I don't get a lot of that. Uh, and I find it, it's just, it's harder to, um, to get that from somebody that just sort of sends you something, right? Like, totally. uh, but like, you know, I mean, when, when I ended up working with Ultra Magnus, I mean, he was fairly new, um, in what he was doing and, and I, I loved what he was doing. It was just like his live show, uh, was just amazing right um and, and so like you know i i saw something in where i was just like yeah i gotta work with this guy oh, yeah. uh the mighty rhino where i did some stuff with him i mean he was still fairly uh, fairly new on the scene at the time he's one of my and, favorite voices on the scene man that yeah dude is you know just like dope. he was doing some you know some pretty crazy stuff and yeah. so you know th there are things like that but i think that probably in general a lot more of it kind of would tend to be me seeing them live or like connecting with them through other people that i know yeah um with that said though i mean there have been like i have like made connections with different people online who um who i potentially would work with that maybe didn't all like you know things didn't always happen from that um you know due to whatever kind of reasons uh and then like i mean um like the the lab like lavender for example i mean she's fairly new and you know again a connection through uh through to chichi but the stuff that i had heard from her I, I really really enjoyed i would love to like work with lavender a little bit more um so i mean there you know there are people out there that um you know that are kind of a bit younger that i would love to work with totally and, just just make uh, an ad sick man i play people every week who make music that has a similar vibe you know that are just from random cities across the country or whatever so yeah you know i i think 
I think there are still people out there making making authentic music, and I think it shines yeah. through. You know, I, like and you I, said, I would lavender. I would love to bring some more of those people on to uh, to Han Solo Records. Definitely, like I, I'd love to kind of bring in some uh, some more young blood in a way, um, you know, and doing something like. Sadly, I would say a lot of what I release, while it may be a little bit kind of like strange, a lot of it falls into the boom bap category. Sure. And, and you know, so I mean, I would be, I would love to, you know, find somebody who's doing, like if somebody was doing some like crazy dope, like mumble rap, I'd be happy to release something like yeah. that. You know, if there was. Man, like, I say it all the time. Like I wasn't a huge fan of trap, but the more I listen to kind of trap and like drill music or whatever, yeah. there are artists out there making trap and drill music. I enjoy, you know, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just takes some looking it just, to me. It'd be finding something that's kind of like, you know, uh, a little bit kind of more crazy and weird. Like the closest I guess I've got to trap is the alien trap Lords. Okay. And you know, that's you know the they're they're that's the weird angle it's the weird <laughs> angle on it yeah yeah i yeah, think it's yeah. Though, yeah so you know it's just but yeah i would um i would definitely love to work with some uh some good younger uh people if i could find some uh it's just i'm unfortunately not exactly um in those circles as much anymore right on it, um, it's hard when you know you're my age to go to a club filled with like you know 20 year olds fair fair <laughs> uh can i can i put you on the spot i ask everybody this one and and ask them to name an artist or two from their scene who they think people should be up on who they might not be up on uh i feel like asking you this like you know you're definitely just going to tell me a couple of different hand solo act <laughs> but along with that maybe is there are there any other artists who you see doing something out there that you enjoy that aren't hand solo affiliates you know i realized you asked this question to everybody and i can't believe that i you know didn't think to come prepared for this one. <laughs> fair um i uh what one, one uh a group that I would probably say, and I, there's slightly, I guess there's a slight hand solo affiliation to it, but um, Sergeant Sergeant and Comrade is somebody that uh, I would love more people to be able to hear. They're they're they are doing quite well. People do tend to uh, to like them. Um, the the connection being like Wadevsky has released some stuff uh, on hand solo, but uh, you know their sound is like extremely different from anything that I would usually do until Although I would be happy to, to work with them. But until no, the I, recent I, fly information, I didn't know what Evsky was comrade. I, I was aware oh. of Sergeant and comrade being, you know, an act out of Calgary. Uh, yeah. And I was aware of what on kind of some weirder rap singles that I see yeah. here and there or whatever. Uh, but I didn't know if that was the same person uh, just yeah. with a different He's also Mo name. Gravy. Okay, that that's the I yeah. He produced a couple of uh, shows. a couple of the tracks on um, on Revenge Two, the Dirty Sample new album. Okay, um, they have like he has a la his label is called uh, or his new label is called Mo Gravy, and so I guess that's what he's like kind of putting his name under for production. But uh, yeah, it's like uh, the production is is good on that. But I just I really love Yolanda's voice. Yeah, like it's just it's got like such a I don't know, like an old school kind of like bluesy sound to it. Very uh, much jazz so. blues. And so, you know, uh, whenever I hear that, it's just like right when I, I can't remember the first time I heard her. I think she was on. It might have been like something with like touch or maybe on something Wodevsky. But yeah, it was just like this is just so such a great voice. Yeah. And um, I know like from re interviews I've seen where like she's been she'd been told at one point like that you know people didn't like her voice or whatever and i i mean it amazes me i'm so glad that she continued to to do what she did because like yeah she definitely found so unique sounding the the niche you know she she got yeah. right in the groove and and has stayed there since i've been aware of her uh, although i think maybe a, a touch release or something along those lines like a feature that touch did on one of their tracks or i don't know what yeah the first time yeah there was yeah there was one early on they had like yeah, a song where touch featured on it and then i think also um uh chalk claire was on the remix with it as well which was yeah. kind of that sounds familiar Touching Claire on like an album with her <laughs> yeah yeah i mean why not right that's that's yeah. dope to see uh, just people across the country link up like that and get the get the legends back out doing the thing or whatever um 
yeah, I appreciate you spending all this time here, man. This is this has been oh, dope. No uh, you've dropped some real jewels, and um, you know, I I also appreciate you facilitating all these people to get their music out to the masses and and sending it over and linking up the interviews and everything. So thank you, thank you, thank you for doing all that. And um, no problem. Thank you for having them on all the time. Hell yeah, man. Uh, I have fun doing it. Makes I my mean, job easier. Some of these things, you know, they're not getting many views over on the YouTube or whatever, but uh, I'm enjoying doing them. And I, I feel like, you know, if I'm learning things and just kind of uh, putting the content out there, maybe somebody watches it sometime, but uh, at least I'm having fun as we go. So oh, yeah, and I mean, you know, like every, every view counts, right? Like you, you never know when that, um, that one important view might happen. Like you could have just like one person who's watching and that person really like who it is that you're interviewing at that point in time, maybe totally. never heard them, covers them and, uh, you know, tell some other people about it and it just spreads from there. Like, that's the whole thing for now. It's just it's, hell yeah. It's well, and I mean, I'm taking the audio kind of from thing. these interviews, pinning them to the end of the at sick episodes now. Uh, so somebody might listen to it, trying to hear, you know, the new song from their favorite artist, and then get sucked into an interview with somebody after that uh, and learn. Well, I hope that I don't bore somebody at the end of your show. <laughs> no, 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 they would never. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're all riveted by this type of content. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who, who's this guy talking about music from 20? years ago <laughs> man <laughs> you're an og on the scene that's who they should they should respect it um but yeah man uh, thanks again for doing this uh we'll pull the plug on this thing and um i'll get the video online sometime next week um yeah appreciate you coming by man thank you for uh having the nerve to want to talk to me oh yeah it was great dude it was great uh here All we right, go man have a good, Take have a good night All right, everybody. So uh, if you didn't know, this was Fly in Formation. That was Thomas Quinlan. After the Smoke is Clear is the mix show that DJ Baggy Lean and I put together every week. We're playing new independent hip hop from across the country. Uh, that is an award that I got for the second season of After the Smoke is Clear. They called it the best rap program in the country. Um, and over there is where you can find the archives, mixcloud.com slash dubious. Uh, coming up here on this Twitch channel, if you're here on Twitch, hit follow um because i've got interviews every tuesday booked i'm gonna be talking next tuesday to old gorilla bones uh so that's on august 15th old gorilla bones slash the dirty sample uh we're gonna talk about his new album revenge volume 2 which we mentioned here talking to thomas quinlan because it's released on hand solo um Old Gorilla Bones will be the first repeat guest on uh, Fly in Formation, so looking forward to talking to him. He was a chill guy to talk to last year. Uh, August 22nd, I'm talking to Epic from Saskatoon Folk Rap Records. Um, he's been, you know, out here on the prairies doing this indie rap thing for a long time, so... I'm looking forward to that. Another Prairie Rap veteran, Arlo Maverick, um, you know, formerly, I believe, of Politic Live, although maybe I shouldn't say formerly, maybe Politic Live is still around and just working on more, more music since last time. I don't know, but Arlo Maverick, um, dope Edmonton MC who uh, has been a big community organizer and, you know, helps people get grants and book tours and all that type of stuff. So uh, I think he'll be somebody good to talk to in the same way that thomas was here um and then september 5th i'm excited i get to talk to winnipeg producer frost gamble who i play almost every episode of at sick him and tone chop are always dropping new music they have weekly drops um and it's always super dope uh just like grimy boom bap stuff tone chop is um an east new york based mc and uh yeah frost gamble said that you know he doesn't normally take interviews but that he likes what i'm doing here on at sick and on fly in formation so uh he took that one so september 5th frost gamble but I appreciate everybody being here today. And, uh, you know, if you listened to At Sick before this and it's on the mix that you're catching it, I appreciate you. Keep coming back. Mixcloud.com slash dubious and dubious.com is the hub for everything that I do. Peace.